we celebrated Valentine's about a week or so ago, and uh, when we gave thanks for the special people we love, and uh, I guess I'm a little late, but I want to talk about love today. I want to talk about the people that we love, and I want to talk about God's love. And I hope that you told and showed that special person how much you love him or her. And I hope that you do that every day because you know that that person is truly God's gift to you. And if you've lost that special person, thank God for all the years of life and love that he has given to you. Because as the poet said, it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Now, I am sure that this talk about love is, is, is bittersweet to some of you who are no longer with the person that you love because of death or separation or divorce, but you did experience God's love and you know that it was real. And to those of you who never married, I'm sure you are conscious of being loved by parents, by friends, by siblings, but for all of us who have accepted Christ as Savior, remember one day, one glorious, glorious day, we will be overwhelmed by a love that we cannot now even imagine when we open our eyes and we will be with God in heaven and it will last forever and ever and ever. Enjoy the love that you have today but know that the best is yet to come. Now my wife and I, Betty and I are gonna celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary next month and I'll never forget one, one night uh, we were both school teachers. We were dating. She was living in Hampton. I was living in Newport News, and we had had a date, and I was on the interstate driving back home to Newport News, and all of a sudden it struck me that she was the one. Finally, I had found her. I knew that I loved her and that she loved me and that we were going to be married, although I hadn't asked her yet. And I remember I just felt so good. I turned off the radio and I thanked God because I knew that he had brought us together. And I want to ask you, if you thank God every day, those of you who are privileged enough to be with your life's love right now, and even if you're not, do you thank God for the years of life and love that God has given to you? And if you are sitting beside that person right now, I want you to turn to him or her and say, I thank God every time I think of you. Go ahead. Well, some of you did wasn't very loud. <laughs> yes, you were in church. You didn't think that you were supposed to talk very loud. I was going through some old papers, and I found something that I shared with this congregation or with congregations here years ago. Some of you will remember it. I think these are kind of cute, and a couple of these, uh, there's a lot of uh, profound things that they say. Children were asked, what is love? And I want to read just a few of them. Rebecca, age eight, says, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and pa paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. She says, that's love. Billy, age four, says, when someone loves you the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. Carl, age five, says when a, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and they smell each other. <laughs> and this one is, is pretty deep actually. 
Bobby, age seven, says, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening your presents and just listen. And I like this one because we're talking about me. Noel, age seven, says, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. <laughs> oh, I can remember when a girl told me a few times that she liked the shirt that I was wearing or something that I was wearing and I made sure I wore that all the time. <laughs> Tammy, age six, says, love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. And isn't that wonderful that when you're in love and you're best friends? Chris, age seven, love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he's handsomer than Robert Redford. And Karen, you have to watch her. When you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out of you. <laughs> Almost finished. Jessica, age eight, says you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. That's a good one. And now this is the important one. A four-year-old child saw his next-door neighbor, an elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife, and he was crying. The little boy went into the old gentleman's yard, climbed into his lap, and just sat there. When his mother asked what he had said to the neighbor, the little boy said, nothing. I just helped him cry. And as ministers, we do a lot of that. We just go and stay with people who are grieving, and we just help them cry. When we make our mistakes, it's when we try to make some big theological statement, or often when we quote a whole lot of scripture. Often it's just being there. And it's the same way for you when they're people, good friends, people that you love. The best thing that you can do is just be with them. Just be with them. And help them cry. Help them grieve. Now, you know the scripture says a lot about love and you should have memorized all four of these. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Greater love has no one than this than he lay down his life for his friends. Love God with your whole heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Now these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And really some words of my own. You know, God wants us to serve him. Of course, he wants us to serve him. But God created us to love him. You know, God's will is going to be done. He gives us the privilege to serve him. What he really created us to do is not so much serve him as to love him. And the way you demonstrate your love, I think, primarily is just taking the time to talk to God. In other words, praying. How often, how much time do you really spend each day talking to God in prayer? You know, you've heard women say, you know, my husband never talks to me anymore. That's the way, you know, she evaluates love. And I think in a, to an extent, we should evaluate how much love we have for God by how often we talk to him. Do we pray very often? Or is it just a quick prayer, a prayer that we memorize like the Lord's Prayer? Or we do, we really just pour out our hearts to God in prayer. And you know, I'm always talking about the quiet time, and I hope that you will spend some time every day, set aside a particular time every day, when you try the best that you can, at least, without fail, to talk to God. Now, I want you to get out your pew Bibles. Nothing wrong with reading scripture from the screen, but we're going to read from the Bibles today. And we're going to read aloud together. And we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It 
It's the love chapter. And uh, you may have your own Bible, so you may be reading a slightly different version, but I think uh, we have the NIV, don't we? Good. We'll be reading from the same Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians who lived in the city, the Greek city of Corinth. It was a very important city, but it was a very immoral city. But there were a lot of Christians there. And believe it or not, the Christians couldn't get along. Can't imagine that, can you? The Christians wouldn't get along. And so Paul is writing this letter to them, talking to them about the importance of love. And so let's read all of this. It won't take that long. It's only 13 verses. Let's read it aloud, okay? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a child, a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We need to remember that the thing that has always set real Christians apart and attracted people to the God that we worship is love. You know that Christianity is under attack today. Many are turning away from God, and our natural instinct is to fight back or to give in and adopt to the, adapt to the world standard. I certainly hope that you're not going to do that. But when we fight back, we have to be careful in the way that we do it. We have to remain firm. But we're not going to win the battle by arguments. We're going to win by loving other people. Loving them into the kingdom of God. Praying for them. Telling them about the God that we worship. And how much he loves them. As the old song puts it, they will know we are Christians by our love. Certainly, hardly anybody is ever argued into the kingdom of God. Don't let yourself be dragged into arguments about spiritual things. Be firm. Let people know what you believe and why you believe it. But most of all, let people know that it's all about God's love, and we need to demonstrate it. Today I want to challenge you. You know that God expects you to go to church. Scripture says, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We know that God expects us to share our faith with other people, 
the last words of Jesus before he ascended into heaven was that we should go into all the world and basically tell other people about him. We know that church attendance is dropping nearly everywhere, but people will come if they know that they will feel God's love demonstrated by those of us that they will meet here in church. That they will feel God's love here. And I want to challenge you to reach out to your neighbors, reach out to your co-workers, just reach out to the people that you know with the love of Christ. Of course we want to let them know what we stand for. We want to let them know that Jesus Christ was the Son of God who came into the world to die for our sins. But we want to let them know that he died for our sins because he loves us. He loves us and because we're his people, we are to love others as well. Serving God can be exciting because what we do in his service can last forever. But the way we serve is by loving, by loving other people. Now I'm going to extend the invitation now. And as we sing, I want to invite you to come forward today if you want to make the most important decision of your life, the decision that will determine where you spend eternity. Maybe you've come to church for a long time. Maybe you haven't been a church goer very much. The question is, have you ever really, personally accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And if you haven't done that, I want to invite you to do it today. Don't hesitate even a day longer because that is the decision upon which your eternity will be based. Just come and we'll talk for a moment and uh, you can talk to the pastor or me later on. But it's something about coming forward in front of all these people. In other words, the, the big thing that keeps you from coming is the most important reason to come. That you are willing to let other people know that yes, I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to give my life to God. I want to invite you to come if you'd like to recommit your life to the Lord. We can talk for a moment and pray together, or you can just stand here and pray and say, Lord, I've wandered, I've wandered away from you, and I want to come home. And I want to invite you to come if you'd like to join our church, or if you just want information about joining our church. And I think we have cards right in the pews. And uh, if you are visiting our church for the first time and you want information, just fill out the card and uh, you can uh, put that in one of these offering plates or you can just come forward and give it to me. So it is decision time. And you know I never, ever finish the sermon without asking you to make a decision. And if you need to make one, I hope you'll make it now. So let's pray. Lord, I'm so thankful that most of the folks here are safely in your arms. That long ago, they gave their lives to you. I did. But I know along the way, I had to recommit my life to you. And probably some of them do too. I know that it was hard for me as an adult to walk the aisle and maybe it's hard for some of the folks here but I did and it made all the difference in the world Lord God we just thank you for your love we thank you for bringing us together we thank you that when we walk out of these doors we will know that you are with us and you will be with us forever in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.